you haven't talked about the graining or degraining and what part of the skin is that up toward the top or down toward the bottom and what are you doing when you say Rem you remove removing the grain? You're removing a layer or more than one layer of your hide after all the dehairing and all the Right, so um, I can explain that here. Historically, right, they would have tried to remove as much of the unused material as possible on the skin. And so you've got the, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, which is outside, middle, inside of the skin. Uh, the hypodermis is where you have a lot of the excess muscle, fiber, stuff like that. Uh, and the epidermis is the grain layer of the skin, where you have that hair follicle patterning and character. Uh, what they would have done to do that is scraping and sanding. Um, we generally don't we remove the hypodermis to clean up the inside of the skin, but we generally leave the grain layer on. Historically, the reason for removing it is so that you could get a very even middle layer of the skin to be able to write on both sides. But if you're going to be binding with it, uh, a lot of the strength resides in the grain. Uh, and leaving that attached so you don't want to remove it. Um, also, some people just like a lot of the character that resides in the grain. So we will just leave that on. What we can do with sanding and stuff like that is still make it permeable without having to remove it entirely. So, so when you're using your orbital sander, you're using it on the epidermis yep. on the outside yep. to, to make it a little more even or to make it a little more permeable. Yes, right. We'll, you'll sand the high spots down and kind of bring up some nap so that inks or, or wash and stuff like that will adhere to the skin without kind of wicking and without just having to sit on the impermeable surface. Yeah, is there a different term that's used for parchment that has the epidermis versus the parchment that doesn't? It's, historically, that was probably parchment versus vellum. Vellum was the higher quality parchment uh, where they would be able to use it in manuscript paper. They'd be able to write on both sides. And what they would have done to get the most consistent and even surface would be remove the epidermis and the hypodermis. So you're left with that middle layer that's the same on both sides. And the reason that that's uh, a good idea is because uh, it parchment reacts to moisture and changes in humidity. But it, it does that at different amounts, depending on what side of the skin you're on. The grain generally will react more violently than the inside of the skin. So removing those and having the same layer on both sides means that whatever is going on, it will react the same on both sides and kind of keep itself stable. Um, and that's still a factor now with leaving the grain on, you get a lot of changes in humidity that will kind of warp the skin or make it not lie flat. But we can also remove the grain layer if people are looking for it, so it's not something that we don't do if we don't need to. Um, sorry, I'm watching this. So this is uh, deer skin. I stretched it about uh, an hour and a half ago, um, and it's largely dry already. Um, but I just wanted to show you what it looked like beforehand, um, and I can I'll stretch to the other one, and then come back to this But so this is a very, even for us, parchment paper. This is a very rudimentary frame that falls apart quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is also a very old frame. Um, we've used this a lot of demonstrations on the road. We've kind of had to disassemble it, reassemble it, so it's seen better being. 
fibers and everything will dry and line up so that uh, there's no space in between for air. So it's very uh, see-through. But um, and this is kind of counterintuitive by pulling the parchment, by stretching it, by making it thinner. You're getting all of those fibers kind of laid down and interweave, which makes it uh, less translucent. And I mean, you can see that even just by by pulling it by hand, it will lighten up to the point where you can't see through it at all. And as long as you stretch it in, in good form so that it stays tight, uh, it will re retain that opacity. Right? That's the word? Mm -hmm. Opacity. Um, so I have to kind of work the edges of this to pull everything up. If you don't do this, you'll get very kind of plasticky, hard edges that are very difficult to, to deal with later. Um, but yeah, so this is a goat, and we've had a lot of people ask about how you can kind of tell the difference, and I imagine a lot of you are familiar with different grain patterns and stuff like that, uh, veining and whatnot that comes with different types of animals or different even breeds of animals within the same type. Um, but a lot of what we use, visual cues that we use to determine differences largely depend on uh, hair follicle patterning, um, coloration once they're dry, and just overall quality of the skin. Um, and again, that's based on modern technology where you can kill a deer with one shot or uh, you can pull a hide off a goat without having to cut into it. Um, so despite how, how much we know about these animals that we deal with, again, it's not necessarily something that could technically carry over to, to being able to look at historical parchment. Um, I know that cap in, in the Middle Ages in England were significantly smaller. I mean, even cow were significantly smaller than, than current. So there's a chance that hair follicle patterning and stuff like that would have been different, would have been different patterns, or you wouldn't have been able to see certain characteristics that we can see today because they are so much larger. Um, but generally, visual cues are, are the best way to try to um, determine what animal you're working with. The other problem, especially with a skin that's like this, is uh, figuring out which side is the grain and which side is the flesh. Um, because it feels very similar on both sides and you've got all of the flesh removed, there's no markers essentially to tell you what side is what. Uh, that you 
skin from this raw state like this up on a frame and scrape within five, six minutes or so. Um, it'll probably take me longer because I can't really multitask very well. So I'll have to stop to explain what I'm doing. Um, but so when we stretch a skin, we generally have to work based on aligning the spine because a lot of the hide will behave around the spine. It'll either have it warp against it or will kind of bubble depending on where the spine is. Um, so the first step is to make sure that you have the spine aligned kind of horizontally. Nope, that's vertical. Aligned vertically. And then you kind of tack down all of the corners um, so that you're, you start with a somewhat flat and square piece of material. And the nice thing about this is that if it doesn't quite reach on one side, you can generally just kind of pull the skin out of demonstrations like this and people are always asking about are we afraid of damaging the skin or anything like that as we're stretching and putting so much tension on it. Um, but this, in a situation like this, you're more likely to have the frame go screwy on you than the skin. Um, so we, and you'll see with the scraping too, you can put a lot of pressure on hides like this as long as they're they're held into the frame well enough. And when we scrape, or when we toggle these up, which doesn't always work, we will work so that you don't kind of pull any one corner or side out into a bubble. So we'll work down one side halfway or so, and then move over to the other side so that it's kind of under even tension all the way around. Right, and these, as mentioned before, these toggles are holdovers from the old tanning industry, but if any, everybody can see it's got a little metal clip on the end, and that was for the giant uh, screen, metal screen pegboard type thing clip it on, pull it, and then just peg it in, and it would hold the skin in place. They're not really useful in this scenario, but they are multi-purpose. And this is a fairly clean goat skin. There's not any uh, unhelpful butchering marks or anything like that, except for this giant gouge in the center. Um, normally goats are generally the cleanest hides that we deal with. They're the easiest to remove from the skin, so they require a less kind of fiddling with a knife in order to get it to come off. Um, why is that? Why? I, because they're older animals generally. Mm -hmm. The older an animal is, the more defined the layers of the skin are. So once you get down to the bottom, it's easier to kind of separate them and pull it off. Calf are tend to be the most difficult because they're young, the layers are fairly interweaved and it's difficult to separate them. Yeah. That's also why we get a lot of, we have trouble <coughs> with our calf, finding calves that are, are butchered well is because they're just difficult to butcher in general. So an older animal not only provides you usually with a larger body, but also easier to process. Yes. The trade-off, though, is that generally you're also, because it's older, it will have more natural marks and scars mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That doesn't usually happen with calf so much, but with goat, it's a, a significant factor. We will often have people looking for large skins, um, which are not difficult to find, but then they'll look 
still want them clean, and that is difficult to kind of piece together. Is there any gender difference between the fineness of the skin? I mean, w women are purported to have softer <laughs> skin than men, and I'm just wondering about female goats. Um, probably yes. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily that women are softer, but <laughs> we have found, I mean, and this is something that even other leather manufacturers that we've dealt with haven't known, is that there is a difference between gender. There's a huge difference between uh, animal types, especially with goat. You have certain breeds that are very, very uh, heavily charactered, certain breeds that are very, very smooth and even, and depending on what age you get them on, or get them from, sorry, um, they will be more or less charactered, or more or less greasy, or more or less stretchy. Um, and it's something that not having, I mean, we work with the butchers and a lot of the farms, and in certain cases, we know exactly what uh, farm, what animal was ra raised at what farm, and what skin that was. Um, but in most cases, it's very difficult figuring out why exactly one skin is smooth and soft and, and pliable versus another skin that's very, very kind of stiff and plasticky. It would require somebody who knows more about uh, animal husbandry. Right, I wonder if the Kobo beef, don't they massage their cows in Japan with milk? I wonder how those things would be for parchment. I would imagine, I mean, I know they do that for, for the leather aspect. There's certain, like, coach bags has their own farm in Italy where they specifically raise cat or cow for their bags and treat them in a certain way. Like they clean the hides every day and it's like a, a giant spa. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, it does greatly yeah. impact how clean and even and consistent the hides are uh, over the lifespan of, of the, the animal which in turn give them a much more even, consistent mm -hmm. material once they're finished and right. using it in a bag or something. Interesting. All right, so I've got this mostly stretched, and I have to go back around um, to make sure that everything's on well enough before I start scraping. Because if you're not careful and try scraping before checking, you'll just kind of fall through the frame, which has happened. <laughs> Can you hear? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm putting quite a bit of tension on this, and you can see, especially along the edges, I don't know if you guys want to move around just to see what it looks like, but you can see along the edges where it's pulling significantly, it's becoming more opaque. Yeah. And the more I do that, the more it will just kind of pull out. So that means that essentially the rest of this hide is still going to be significantly, or can be more stretched. And I should have, didn't think about this until afterwards, but showing you the difference in size, I mean, depending on the size of the animal will affect how large the skin becomes at the end. But even fairly small skins can be very, very large finished products if you're, you're doing it correctly. So right now, uh, before stretching, this skin is maybe 10 inches across here and 24 inches across here. By the time I'm done, it'll probably be 28 inches wide most of the way down. Um, so all of this will stretch out and pull out and become opaque. So a lot of the... So is that about two and a half times the size you start with? It depends. Goat generally, yeah, you get yeah. probably at least twice as much material okay. surface area once you're finished stretching. And that's, I mean, it's helping to thin the skin out. So you are certainly, that process will help make it thinner, which is nicer for uh, using in manuscript leaves and stuff like that. But this scraping process is also kind of to squeegee the skin. Yeah. So you'll be putting pressure on it, forcing as much moisture out as you can. That also helps to dry them. On um, this one, dried it an hour and a half ago, and 
I guess this room is fairly dry, so it helps that a lot. But you can have them on a frame and dry within a few hours or so once you you've got them up and scraped. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask about the wetness and how key that is for the stretching process. Um, if it's not significantly damp enough, you will end up kind of, some of it will be rubbery and, and pliable, some of it will just be plasticky to start. What we'll try to do sometimes is, on more problematic skins, we will stretch it, um, and especially with cat, you will get uh, certain areas of the skin that are more difficult to stretch than others. Um, that's generally here, which are the hips of the animal, so right, anatomy of a goat. <laughs> Tail, back legs, front legs, neck. Um, so you usually will get uh, transparent spots here on the back hips. Um, the, well the groin and the armpits will be very thin. Um, and you can kind of see here, this is, is more fuzzy than the area around it. That's because uh, it's a very porous, loose structure in the skin itself already. So you can't do much more to work around that. Um, but we will often have to go back on cap to, to re-scrape these areas because they tend to be more baggy. Mm -hmm. And so you scrape it and you can only go so far because the area around it only goes so far. <coughs> and they'll dry transparent, but as it's drying, we'll go back and scrape it. Um, and that will bring out some of the opacity and it will kind of leave a, a pocket in the parchment. While the rest of it is dry, this is, is kind of dry in this state. If you do it correctly, you can get that to lie flat and still be opaque. Um, but if you try to scrape something like this that's not significantly damp, it'll just be kind of scraping plastic. It won't do anything other than mark it up. Um, so before I do it, I'm just kind of testing to see if there's any loose areas on the skin. This, if I hit it, will show me whatever toggle bounces the most still has some tension you can pull out of it, but it seems pretty, pretty even. Um, all right, so scraping. And this, as I mentioned before, is a repurposed um, leather cutting tool. But how we hold it like this, you can put a lot of pressure right at the tip, um, and it allows you to kind of to squeegee the skin down uh, with this other one, you can see evidence of it here. Because it's a deer and it was poorly butchered, there was a lot of excess flesh and stuff on the inside. So this stage in the scraping will pull a lot of that off if there is some. This was done very cleanly, so there's not much excess uh, muscle or fat or anything to scrape off. So this is just to kind of loosen the fibers, get it to lay down, and to remove some of the moisture. Especially on the edges where you've got thinner parts of the skin 
with the new frame that we use, this is a much easier process than having these kind of removable toggles or <coughs> towels. But it is a very physical task, which is nice when you do a lot of sitting at a desk answering emails too, so it's see this is tearing. Obviously this is much larger than it started at. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you don't have something that is along a cut, a flesh cut like, like these, you can still have it kind of eat into the usable space. Essentially, that's it. Normally on the skin, we probably wouldn't have bothered to do something like this because it's got a giant <coughs> hole inside. Um, but by this stage, also this one, I don't know, you could probably hear how much it sounded like you were just scraping a dry piece of plastic. But this is <coughs> not as, as, uh, as soaked as we would normally run the skin through. Most of the time they're very, very soft and pliable. This <coughs> I soaked yesterday in our tub and then had to put in a, a garbage bag with some water. So <laughs> that was the best I could do. Um, but right, so it's it's quite a bit larger and on a normal skin you would have a solid two foot by three and a half, four foot piece of parchment you could get text out of. Um, and right, historically, uh, goat, calf, and sheep would have been used. Um, and after this stage, once it dries, they would go back with this guy. Um, and this would essentially, this doesn't have it because we don't really use this normally, but you would have to put a burr on this. So one edge was hooked, and you would go back across a dry skin, and this would catch a lot of this rough, fibrous material and just kind of pick it up and slice it off so you would have a much more smooth, even surface on this side. After that, um, because of its inherent qualities, you can essentially take a skin, a dry skin like this, re-soak it and it becomes pliable again. You can flip it over, stretch it going the other way so that the grain is on the outside mm -hmm. and then do whatever el other processing you need to do. You can do that indefinitely just about. Um, we generally do about, run most skins through two to three times. Um, rough scrape, uh, we'll sand this and then re-soak it and re-stretching it, a lot of this rough nap 
that will come up when you dry it, or when you sand it after it's dry, will re-glue itself flat. So you'll get a, a very, very even surface, much more akin to the grain side of the skin, which is helpful because then you can just kind of sand it to bring up the right amount of nap, rather than have to scrape down to a specific layer. And that's where the orbital sander for us comes in. You don't have to be too particular about what level of the skin you've gotten into. You can just kind of, as long as it's even, you can bring out the right amount of, of fiber to, to tank ink and stuff like that. What they would have needed to do historically um, is make sure that they're on the right specific layer of the skin, usually the dermis, um, which is, is naturally porous and, and has certain characteristics that they would look for because they didn't have access to orbital sanders and stuff like that, they had much more, a much more hard time doing that by sanding itself. And I have a few traditional, uh, this is a pumice stone, <coughs> kind of looks like a dried liver, but um, you would take this and, that's not, oh, this, here. this one in the back here, which is what I did earlier, But a lot of times the, the stretching and scraping aspect and the kind of thinning down aspect were done by the parchmenters themselves. And I imagine that they had people within their own guild who had specific knowledge about finishing the parchment afterwards. So it's not something that generally anybody who could stretch parchment would know how to prepare it to, to be used for writing or binding or anything like that. But so these are their sanding tools essentially. With pumice you would have just kind of and you can see that it's, it's bringing up a lot of dust and fuzz and that's the loose fiber is kind of being pulled off and, and, and uh, removed. Um, and this is a little more modern. This is, these are pieces of bread with glass in them. Uh, and depending on the kind of gauge of the glass, you can have a rough sand or a very smooth, fine sand. But beyond doing something like this, which they would have to replace fairly frequently. Um, it was much easier back then to, to have a blade because you could scrape the skin uh, down to a certain layer and then all the preparation would just be kind of the, the, the sander rack and the, the whitewash that they would use. Um, and you can see that this is kind of, this is not entirely dry, so I scraped this area and it became more loose than the rest of it because there's still humidity in it. But as it dries further, it will kind of flatten out again. But something, a blade like this would have allowed you to do a much larger swath over each pass. So you can get more out of a, a single swipe removing the, the excess material than you could with just a sander. Um, but so, right, finishing would essentially be scraping, sanding, removing the excess layers. They would have, for most, or for a lot of manuscript material, they would have done the same process on the grain side to remove the uh, epidermis, which is a little more difficult. Um, so they would have had finer tools for it. But there's a my brother likes to say this a lot because he doesn't find it interesting, I guess. But um, the, the phrase, make the blade sing, it's similar to this, where you can you have, hear a specific tone when you're scraping. And the parchmenters would, would be good enough where, as they're scraping, they would know what layer of the skin they're at by the tone of the, the blade, how, it, how it's it sings essentially, and they would be able to figure out when they need to stop by how much material had been removed and how it affects the blade. 
that's all kind of drowned out by the sound of sanding now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we don't have to worry about that too much. But so other than that, and the use of sanders versus um, scraping tools and hand sanding, um, a lot of I mean, the process is still essentially the same. We have to take every skin, stretch it individually, sand and prepare each side individually, depending on its end use. Um, so it's a very old process, but it's still as, as streamlined as, as it can be. Um, and that's it. Essentially, that's all the way through. Any questions?